Hello, I'm here to talk about decolonising the dental curriculum. My name's Dr. Amali Lokigamage. I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist, and honorary associate professor at the UCL Institute for Women's Health, and I've done some decolonisation work within medicine. Uh, UCL has just uh, issued this report uh, on cultures of decolonisation at UCL, and some of the work that I've been involved with has been mentioned. Uh, but um, I'm going to show you this bubble diagram right at the end again, because uh, that's quite useful. Um, but also I like this, um, uh, I like this cultural understanding of that decolonization is actually a provocation and that is its value and it can be very discomforting for some. I've spent um, quite some time looking at decolonising the medical curriculum at UCL Medical School with some colleagues of mine. Um, and this was a revelation to myself um, because I hadn't really appreciated that decolonisation refers to attempts to overturn the historic uh, power imbalances uh, that are within biomedicine and healthcare. In medicine, uh, we recognise that um, the whole system was set up uh, with a Euro-American model that had deep roots in colonial era medicine and shaped by the hierarchies of power that existed and their legacy still remains. To truly understand the structural injustices within healthcare systems, one has to apply a decolonial lens. Um, and also perhaps a geographic lens so that you could understand the particular oppressions of certain areas of the world. This legacy of bias and disempowerment in, within healthcare has given rise to racism, sexism, heteronormativism, classism and ableism. This presentation will cover these key decolonial areas. There are other areas that could be talked about, but I do not have the time within this presentation. Uh, I will cover histories of exploitation, androcentric ideas of healthcare, that's patriarchy in healthcare, uh, colonial legacies in higher education, diagnostic bias in darker skins, epistemic and geographic bias in knowledge production, the power imbalances between allied professional groups, power imbalances between healthcare providers and patients, uh, medical interventions versus ecological interventions, reverse innovation, and the dangers of cultural appropriation. So let us start with UCL itself. Um, and the attainment gap is part of decolonization. And I know that you've touched on it with um, EDI education. So I'll just mention it here that um, the people that dominate academic positions within dentistry, uh, uh, the same in medicine, tend to be white and male. Um, so there is a gap that needs to be uh, made smaller. If a particular group in society hold the power then uh, this can result in the power imbalances that um, we can see in terms of uh, injustices and lack of inequality in healthcare. So when you look at power, you need to actually look at the location of it, the concentration of it, and then examine the power imbalances and the oppressions that are exerted thereon in. Without examining history, then, uh, you can't really understand how, um, how often the power imbalances became invisible. And it's only recently, for instance, at UCL, uh, the history of eugenics has been examined in a inquiry um, and the university is making uh, attempts to um, to mend the situation, um, offering an apology, um, thinking about renaming bu buildings that were named after eugenicists. 
so this is work that is unfolding. Within dentistry, there is an entanglement with slavery histories, the Euro-American uh, links uh, with the sugar trade, uh, plantation, um, slaves, exploitation, the sugar trade and its impact on dental caries, uh, its impact on the most vulnerable uh, segments of society, um, and even uh, some histories that are little explored as yet. For instance, um, there is a story of George Washington's dentures uh, being made from ivory metal and the human teeth from slaves who did not consent to their teeth being extracted for his dentures. Moving back to the UK, there are uh, growing amounts of observational uh, reports being published demonstrating structural racism. And we can see this from the uh, Marmot Review 10 years on in terms of healthcare. Within dentistry itself, uh, this paper by Lala, published in 2022, states that dentistry's hierarchized epistemic paradigm is complicit in racial harms. Dental knowledge promotes Eurocentric beauty ideals and effaces the role racism uh, plays in the caries related inequalities, which is something I mentioned before. Following on from that, uh, Lala says, patriarchal character of beauty practices, the Eurocentric smile ideal also disproportionately impacts on women who cannot afford cosmetic dentistry and people living with facial differences. Further to this, the Eurocentric beauty ideal and the whole private cosmetic dentistry industry juxtaposes the lack of provision of dental care uh, and basic access for working class and racially minoritized people experiencing greater levels of oral disease. So this uh, alludes to an interconnectedness and the reinforcing characteristics of um, and the requirement for decolonization within dentistry. Within medicine, uh, more recently since George Floyd's death, there has been a lot of talk about the absence of teaching materials um, on people with darker skins. Um, we know, for instance, that uh, people with darker skins have delay in diagnosis of skin cancers, uh, increasing their mortality, um, and this might even stretch to a lack of teaching of cyanosis in people of uh, greater pigmentation. Uh, there are quite a few projects afoot to address this now. Um, the British Association of Dermatologists have uh, develop resources um, and seriously address their uh, curriculum on this matter and a medical, a former medical student, Malone McWende's book, Mind the Gap, which uh, is a free resource of clinical um, symptoms in an atlas format in darker skins, um, has been quite popular. Um, so uh, in dentistry, this too uh, must be looked at. In this publication about decolonizing the dental curriculum, um, there is a uh, mention uh, that the um, that in dark skinned people, um, oral manifestations of the disease may look different. For instance, leukoderma um, looks different in black individuals compared to white individuals. This knowledge bias with external skin and uh, skin diseases um, is also uh, part of a greater knowledge bias where 
most of the knowledge that is transmitted through medical school and dental school is uh, from authors or institutions that are uh, Euro-American centric. Um, in this map, which shows uh, the geographical location of um, citations, papers, which constitute our knowledge in uh, science and medicine, um, that most of the publications come from the global north and um, the, the kind of uh, global south is very much underrepresented. So basically Eurocentric ideals are perpetuated within um, knowledge creation and there is a, a need to, to kind of recenter the global south in terms of knowledge production and also other ways of thinking and the sort of philosophies of, uh, of Eurocentric healthcare. Uh, looking at epistemic bias in dentistry, um, the academic Lala has uh, also mentioned the fact that uh, orthodontics uh, treatment needs scores have been created principally by a group of white dental academics. So um, they normalize uh, the expression of uh, white morphology rather than um, other cultural morphology. And um, people who are non-white may be classified as having pathology, uh, whereas it might actually be normal for them. And demonstrating uh, the point made in the previous slide, this publication again show, uh, shows that, uh, for instance, um, diastemas are more common in non-European people and more likely to score as needing treatments using Western orthodontic indices. So having, having given you some taste of possible um, epistemic biases in dentistry, let's uh, look more to racism, which is um, what is more commonly known about um, decolonization. Um, in the UK, um, most black and brown people have emigrated in, and certainly there have been waves of Commonwealth migration from the ex uh, British Empire, such as um, the 27K Ugandan Asians uh, forced to emigrate after Idi Amin's dictatorship. Um, and uh, the Windrush generation, half a million economic migrants. In these groups of people, uh, there are health come discrepancies such as diabetes, mental health, palliative care. Uh, in the first wave of COVID-19, more black and Asian patients died as compared to white patients. And even in staffing groups, more black and brown um, staff died of COVID-19 um, than their white counterparts. A paper from the Lancet group of journals on um, racism and oral health inequity um, made a good summary of the challenges ahead, uh, which, uh, which dentistry needs to look at in terms of structural racism. Um, and the next few slides are actually from this paper. Uh, so racism, uh, and the inequitable access to oral health is, is a real problem in dentistry. And then also there are psychological and physical, physiological outcomes uh, which impact on oral health behaviours. And, um, and so there is a great undermining of uh, universal dental health care within the UK. So the publication also highlights structural racism, but this is also structural classism as well, um, which is inherent in the current system within the UK. 
um, and uh, the paper refers again to the recruitment and selection of dental uh, students and progress in careers, um, that there's uh, little work or too little work on uh, improving cultural um, safety, I would say. I actually do not like the use of cultural competency and I'll explain that later. It has many flaws that, but um, it's often not culturally safe for uh, people to enter uh, dental care, especially when vulnerable and disadvantaged and of low economic status. Um, the uh, barriers uh, start from even receptionist staff, as well as other levels of personnel, and finally the dentist. Um, and obviously it's very clear in dentistry, there is little recognition of the cumulative impact of uh, racism and classism on access to dental care. Um, there is, of course, the clinician bias in terms of offering more extraction versus restorative services to um, to people of ethnic minorities as a RCT on that, I believe. Um, and then, of course, uh, with reference to the, sort of the sugar industry, the marketing of oral health damaging foods and beverages are often targeted at the socially vulnerable. And um, there are um, there just needs to be more done in terms of policy um, and decolonization. So some examples of intrapersonal uh, racism is the kind of acceptance of these vulnerable communities of poor oral health and uh, mixed with their own feelings of guilt and shame and lack of confidence and a sort of fatalism that poor oral health is the norm for them. This all amounts to structural iatrogenesis, that is um, a situation where patients are harmed by unconscious and or conscious racist power imbalances in the actual bureaucratic cultural systems of healthcare. Uh, this is not just racism, but other aspects of oppressions, which I mentioned in the first few slides. In terms of structural biases, there are steep power asymmetries from um, the kind of policymakers down to the recipients of care. And a way around this is uh, developing co-production of health policies uh, with the patients uh, as the norm. And this is certainly increasing. Uh, there, here's, a, here's a document recently about co-production. I have a paper out on uh, cultural safety and how it's actually more advantageous than cultural competence. Um, and cultural safety uh, involves co-production and patient voices shaping healthcare systems. Um, this is an infographic, but within the publication, there is a table if uh, visual representations are difficult for you to navigate through. Cultural safety is a uh, decolonial um, anti-racism strategy uh, that originated from um, a Maori nurse educator, Iri Hapati Ramsdom, in uh, New Zealand. And uh, it was created through the wisdom of the indigenous people that were oppressed by the British colonizers. Um, and uh, there is much to learn, actually, if, uh, in terms of the British ex-empire, uh, learning from its previously oppressed um, subjects in terms of anti-racism strategy for healthcare. Uh, the, the tree infographic, and you'll appreciate some similarities in terms of um, the movie Avatar and trees, um, but we have um, funneled all of that information onto a table 
Um, and it, a cultural safety involves sort of three levels of uh, of looking at um, uh, legacies of racism within he healthcare. And one is, as we all know, patient-centered approach, nurturing principles, um, and here lies co-production, uh, person-centered care, the availability of interpreters, uh, continuity of care. Um, but also the next um, level is staff and their ability uh, to conduct self-reflexivity. Um, this involves a decolonized, a decolonized education syllabus, uh, which would uh, use transformational learning theory and understanding of colonial history and inequality, uh, reflexivity about power and privilege, and um, and also understanding epistemic knowledge biases and the acceptance that we might need to recenter other other ways of healing in oral health. Um, and then lastly, the, the level of structural reflexivity from institutions who should commit to review their structural knowledge biases and assumptions. I have mentioned that cultural competency, competency has some flaws and it's an idea perpetuated in EDI and its flaws really are that it's sort of created top down and um, has uh, sort of run the risk of stereotyping uh, cultures through the eyes of uh, the Eurocentric uh, syllabus creators, uh, the exotic house, so they can they can perpetuate cultural stereotypes. It doesn't really engage in power and power imbalances. And then, of course, have the reflexivity around uh, providers of healthcare reflecting on their power and privilege and the way it could impact on their um, interactions. And it also doesn't uh, really uh, highlight the importance of patient experience and patient co-production in healthcare systems. But cultural safety has all of those aspects, so that's why I think there is an advantage of using this. Also, it is an innovation from uh, previously colonised people, um, and so it is a reverse innovation uh, that could uh, be extremely helpful for the UK. Uh, there are papers showing that unconscious bias training um, doesn't really do the job. So how do you generate uh, reflexivity? And really, I think it's about uh, transformational learning, that those are educational situations which have a provocation, uh, something to put people into a liminal space uh, where they're biases can be challenged from within themselves. It can also be uh, through bi-directional knowledge, patients as educators, um, and uh, co-production of educational materials. Uh, Decolonisation can be a fiery space because of the long-standing oppressions. Um, and I've got very interested in a decolonial concept of education called rhizomatic education, which is, uh, I suppose, summarises community as curriculum. I mentioned that cultural safety, um, if it was interpreted and used in the UK, would be a reverse innovation. A reverse innovation is a term, again, uh, in decolonisation, for uh, knowledge uh, or innovations that have arisen from areas of the world that were either economically disadvantaged to a country that ha is uh, very wealthy economically, uh, or it can be uh, reversed through power structures of uh, people who were disadvantaged, um, growing knowledge, and this is transferred to those who were uh, advantage, but you have to make sure 
that uh, we humbly learn from uh, the people that the knowledge originates from and um, understand that it can help with uh, visualising epistemic blind spots and power imbalances and all of those actual prejudices set up and ingrained during biomedicine of colonial times. In the introduction to the next slide, um, I will also say that in recentering other forms of knowledge to address um, epistemic biases that, uh, that um, are there, which I showed you on a map, for instance, um, there is clearer and clearer information that lots of guidelines within medicine um, actually aren't as high quality as you would think in terms of evidence. And here is a recent um, article on a paper um, in 2020 showing that only one in 10 medical treatments are supported by high quality evidence. Uh, so there might be a bit of an emperor's new clothes effect in terms of guidelines if you don't actually look at the quality of the evidence behind them. Um, I've looked in my own speciality and only 13% of um, the guidelines for obstetrics and gynaecology have good quality um, evidence and actually if you discount, say, A and B level evidence, 75% uh, of what we do or say to patients is not based on strong evidence. Uh, so this is why um, part of decolonization uh, in medicine overall, and perhaps in dentistry, uh, could uh, look at oral health pluralism. Uh, Western medicine hasn't got the answer to everything and there there is uh, information circulating and some dentists that practice uh, hypnosis for anxiety and pain, um, some dentists are trained in osteopathy which look at the whole structure and bone system of the body and it's a whole body approach to um, adjunctive care in dentistry, uh, acupuncture can be helpful for various types of pain syndromes in pain. And um, from my area of the world, Ayurvedic medicine certainly has a long history of using plants to improve dental health and oral hygiene. Um, so a requirement uh, for funding to look at these other sources of knowledge uh, is part of decolonization and is a very discomforting space for those who have traditionally spurned other sources of knowledge. When you take knowledge from other cultures, it is very important not to culturally appropriate them. That is, uh, when um, a technology or an innovation uh, is taken from a historically disadvantaged culture and uh, used, but there is no credit to the traditional approaches or the origins. Uh, several drugs, for instance, um, have their origins in indigenous medicine um, and uh, accusations about cultural appropriation are afoot with respect to meditation, acupuncture, yoga. Um, so uh, care has to be taken uh, for a respectful approach to reverse innovation up with the last few slides that decolonization also encompasses ecology and public health um, and also uh, reaches to the Anthropocene which is in terms of climate climate change very relevant uh, the Anthropocene is the new geological epoch of uh, humanity's damaging influence on the biosphere and this um, is written about in publications such as Lancet Planetary Health, if you want to look further. Colonisation, uh, the Anthropocene, lends itself to the microbiome, um, and this is through um, farming, environmental practices, the sugar industry that can impact on the microbiome of the mouth. Legacies of colonial injustices can be 
transmitted uh, transgenerationally, and this can be seen in health-seeking behaviours, and also an epigenetic phenomena called weathering. When attempting to decolonize um, healthcare, one has to make sure you're not shoehorning your understanding into uh, a kind of colonial structure of learning, thinking of situations in binary terms uh, rather than a multifaceted way. Um, so we have to be careful. UCL has committed to uh, cultures of decolonization, as demonstrated in this um, report. Uh, you have to understand that some of what I've said might be provocative, uh, might be discomforting, but that is all part of decolonization. Thank you for listening to me. Here's the bubble diagram from that uh, UCL report. Um, these are the people that have influenced me and I give thanks to them. And here are a few of my decolonial publications. Thank you very much.